Um, you know, with me today, I've got, I think, esteemed speakers to my right. I've got uh, Abu Bakar Bujasi uh, Mayanja, who's the managing partner of ABL Associates. Uh, to my left, I've got uh, Navjir Jaffer, Assistant Secretary General of the Muslim Council of Britain. And to my leftmost is Basim Alkara, who's the Executive Director of the Sacramento Chapter Council on American Islamic Relations. So as you can see, the panelists today are quite diverse. And, and, and you know, with that, hopefully they'll bring the diverse background experiences to be shared uh, with the participants. Um, this time around, we're going to run this session in a very interesting way. Right? So we're going to break it into two parts. So the speakers are going to have and make an opening remark for about 15 minutes in total. After that, we're going to open the session to the floor. So each one of you actually would have the ability and the opportunity to influence the direction of the discussion today. So you're allowed to you know, put in some comments, uh, you're allowed to raise questions, but please you know, be respectful to others and please stay relevant to the topic. Now, after that, we're going to have another 20 minutes for the speakers to respond or to address some of the questions that you've raised and probably to, to react and, 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 and you know, give their response to what you have uh, put up in, in the earlier part of it. And then at the end of it, we're going to close and then we're going to tell you the little experiment that we want to run uh, at the end of the session. So without further delay, I'd like to invite uh, Abu Bakr to give us an overview as to where the Muslim world really is and how we fare in terms of the spirit of entrepreneurship. Abu Bakr, please. I take this opportunity to welcome all of you here today. And uh, we're trying to discuss about entrepreneurship in the Muslim world, just to get an idea of the scale. Uh, there are about 1.6 billion Muslims in the world, and 62% uh, of which are in the Asia Pacific region. 20% are in the Middle East, and about 15% in Sub-Saharan Africa. So, the specific countries are, we've got uh, Indonesia, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Iran, Turkey, Egypt, Afghanistan. So we are defining countries that have a majority population of Muslims. Then uh, there are some countries that have very large Muslim populations, but uh, they, the Muslims are not a majority, and uh, these are uh, we've got Nigeria, China, Russia, and Ethiopia. So this is uh, the general region we are covering. In order to have a measure of how entrepreneurship is doing in these countries, I referred to the World Bank Doing Business Survey that ranks countries The World Bank Doing Business Survey is an international index that compares how countries, the business environment that encourages entrepreneurship. We believe that this is a good proxy to get an idea of where the Muslim, the Muslim world is in terms of enabling business. Uh, you'll be, it will be interesting to note that uh, Singapore is the number one ranked country currently, and it's just a neighbor to Malaysia. And Malaysia is the highest ranked Muslim country at number 12. Uh, it will also be interesting to note that uh, the United Arab Emirates comes number 26. Um, Niger is an African country with a Muslim majority, perhaps the only sub-Saharan Africa that has a Muslim majority. And it comes in at number 176. Uh, the ranks are out of uh, 185. Then Syria comes in at uh, 144, Yemen 118, Malaysia, of course, I've already talked about that, is the highest ranked at number 12. Perhaps it's a spillover from Singapore, which is just a neighbor here. And uh, Sudan, 143, Iraq, 165, 
Turkey 71, Pakistan 107, Bangladesh 129. Uh, looking at those numbers, it's very clear that you know, something needs to be done. And uh, I'll leave it at that so that we can discuss and my, my, my pa fellow panelists can share with you the experiences. But generally, the rankings indicate that something needs to be done because the, the, the Muslim countries or countries of the Muslim majority are not ranked very high, very highly in this. Thank you very much for articulating the overview of where the Muslim world is. Now, picking on from that point, um, Nash, if I could just throw this question to you. If you could talk about the experience of the UK being one of the many gold standards that we have, and, and what can we actually learn from them? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, Salaam alaikum. Um, in the UK, um, you know, the, the UK government and the private sector has been looking at a number of areas on how to encourage entrepreneurship. Um, and, and entrepreneurs, especially in, in the UK, as many of, you, many of you probably heard the phrase, the UK is a nation of shopkeepers. And uh, it, it still is, I guess. Um, the, the entrepreneurs uh, who set up, right, typically in startup phase, small and medium-sized enterprises, um, broad definition, companies which employ less than 250 people, the SME sector, uh, accounts for new job creation. About two-thirds of all new jobs come from the SME sector. Um, also, SMEs employ around 60% uh, of all employees in the private sector in the UK. So it's clearly uh, the engine of growth is, is where the government sees it. And, and, and there's a culture of entrepreneurism in the UK. And you'd have heard of very famous entrepreneurs like James Dyson, Richard Branson, etc. Now, just sort of unraveling this a little bit, um, you know, we talk about new job creation. Well, is it all SMEs? Surprised to find. Uh, no, it is. And it's really the high growth, uh, small and medium sized enterprises. And high growth being defined as those which create more than, say, 90 jobs a year. And they tend to be across all sectors. It's, it's a myth where people sort of think that the high growth stuff all comes from the tech sector. And I know uh, my fellow colleague Barson will speak a lot more about uh, what's happening in the US. But it's, a, it's generally a myth. When McKinsey's did a survey around this, they found that actually the high growth. Uh, companies actually across all sectors, across all regions, uh, and, and uh, in, in no sector is it more than 5%, and in no sector is it less than 1% of the companies which are high growth companies. And clearly the other areas around uh, regulation, uh, a common bugbear, uh, I'm a, when we sort of went out, uh, I'm a, also a member of a cross-parliamentary group on SMEs, and when we sort of asked the members, you know, what can the government do more of? And, and as you'd probably expect, you know, less regulation, regulation both in terms of employment legislation, which is quite onerous in the UK, and, and uh, also clearly around taxes as well. You know, uh, how, how can uh, and, uh, you know, taxes be both in terms of the percentage of tax paid? So in the UK, there's a threshold where smaller companies pay less tax. If you have a turnover of less than 75,000, you don't have to register for VAT, so less of a compliance burden. But also around... Um, just in terms of the process of getting set up. Uh, so so th these are areas which the government has been looking at. But again, these were not the primary issues which SMEs had. Yes, taxes and regulation are a big part. But fundamentally, the key barriers to growth are the ability to access finance, especially during the, uh, during the last three, four, five years uh, when we've had the credit crisis. So the ability to access finance, which is flexible, uh, more akin to an overdraft, but not with such high interest rates, um, and, and, the, and, and, and really encouraging the banks to lend uh, at a level which they were pre the crisis. So that, that was deemed as a key area, the most primary area as a barrier to growth. Uh, in addition to that, it's actually a market for their services or goods. So, you know, SMEs found it very difficult uh, to actually create a, a, a sustainable market for goods and services. And again, this is where the, both the private sector uh, can, can assist with, and as well as the public sector. Just by way of brief example, if you look at the private sector, for example, mentorship, business coaching, uh, some kind of a, a spirit of supporting entrepreneurs, 
um, and, and you know, those who've done that have done that very well and found that actually it enhances their own businesses. So very much a change in mindset is required amongst the large companies in, in the private sector. A mindset of actually collaboration with entrepreneurs, nurturing entrepreneurs in their vicinity or in their industry, rather than a mindset of feeling that this is going to be the next large company of tomorrow, a mindset of competition. So very much around collaboration rather than competition. And I to just really finish off here also in terms of what the government can do a bit more of in terms of helping cash flow for businesses is uh, the UK government, for example, is looking at late payment legislation. Too often in the past, large businesses have taken advantage of smaller businesses by um, you know, stretching the payment terms and, and, and really messing up the small businesses' cash flow issues. So that's a big area which the UK government is looking at in terms of late payment legislation and also facilitating uh, accessibility to centers of excellence. So, for example, one thing they've done also in the UK is a, a, what is called Growth Accelerator. It's a website which uh, entrepreneurs can go to, which can, again, provide assistance, both in terms of training, uh, how to access finance, um, how to commercialize uh, innovation, uh, register your IP, and also how to market your products. Um, as well as that, other private organizations have set up Mentor, Mentor SME, which is where entrepreneurs can go if they want to be mentored um, by a business coach. Um, finally, I'll just finish off with the role of non-government organizations. The Muslim Council of Britain, for example, has uh, for the last 10 years run leadership development programs, uh, which uh, are open to the whole community and, and also attended by entrepreneurs. Also, this is quite a detailed program where, you know, uh, it's a run over a course around four to six weekends, and it's life-changing. Uh, it, it looks at uh, how to develop leadership capacity uh, fundamentally around self-analysis and also around what other stuff that MCB have done is effective negotiation skills courses, uh, run over residential weekends, as well as working with the UK government introducing Islamic finance and facilitating the introduction of Islamic finance in the UK, changing legislation, um, and, and helping make London a centre of finance. So with that in mind, I'd like to pass on to Basim, who will give us some key lessons, I assume, from the, from the, he's learned from the US. Assalamu alaikum. I can't hear you. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> all right, it's an honour to be here. I'm in Malaysia. I came all the way from California, just arrived. Um, so I'm really excited. Um, I'll tell you, in, in the US, uh, policies do help, of, of course. Um, in the U.S., President Obama launched Startup America, where billions of dollars um, from the government and hundreds of millions of dollars from the private industry uh, were pulled together to start many different projects. Uh, Two billion dollars uh, through this um, Small Business Bureau, uh, Small Business Administration, was given out to small businesses to encourage small businesses, businesses, and also companies such as Intel and others put hundreds of millions of dollars to train and mentor young people, to encourage them to be entrepreneurs. But at the end of the day, uh, policies is not what creates an entrepreneur, right? Entrepreneurs have been around forever. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was an entrepreneur. Uh, entrepreneurs have been around for centuries. Sometimes actually policies can hurt um, gr um, um, entrepreneurship. For example, in the United States, bad immigration. It's really hurting us in the US. Uh, we don't have that much talent as, as before. Uh, so we rely heavily on folks from this part of the world, from India. Uh, and because of our bad immigration, it's really affecting us in Silicon Valley of not being able to grow some of, uh, of the companies due to, due to this limit. Lack of research and funding starves idea and talent. And then bad ta uh, taxes make people move. You guys know about this in this region. Uh, one of the co-founders from Facebook, right, he gave up his American citizenship and came to Singapore to save uh, you know, maybe 20, 30, 40 million dollars. Uh, so, so if we work on some of our tax policies, it can encourage uh, more entrepreneurship. Now to grow a company to scale, um, and it, you need the following. Good idea, capital, talent and knowledge, partnerships and ecosystem, right? I mean, if Zuckerberg had a great idea, right, but if he didn't have, if he didn't have capital, he could have never grew Facebook, right? So the, the challenge that we have in the Muslim world, it's the lack of early stage risk capital, right? 
to the big problem in the Muslim world, a lack of early stage risk capital. Now this is ironic, given that the Sharia, right, forces us to match and reward and is aligned with entrepreneurship, right? And so this kind of capital also has to come with knowledge. And I'll tell you something, but when it comes to, when it comes to knowledge, I mean, Europe has a challenge right now. How do you, you needed the knowledge to identify a company to go invest in that. So now in Silicon Valley, which is saturated with investors, you have folks moving from Silicon Valley to, to, to London and to Europe um, because they're in, in some areas, of course, uh, our friends here, they have the knowledge, but some other folks in, in, in Europe don't, don't have the knowledge, so our our, your American friends are helping out. Now, the Muslim world, and, and many parts of the world, of course, um, they lack talent and knowledge. Now, of course, there are exceptions, right? According to the report um, that Nash was talking about, um, Indonesia has a great um, you know, excess talent pool, Egypt and, and other, other countries, but still, we don't have it in large doses throughout the Muslim world. And we also have limited success stories, right? Limited success stories. It's so important to have success stories so people can dream. This is why, you, there's a reason why Silicon Valley um, is in California. California is a very free-spirited place where people dream big, right? People want to realize their dreams, they go out to California, whether it's to go surf or whether it's to find, to find a company. And they go there and they're not afraid of failure. Right? In the Muslim world, right, if you don't become a doctor or engineer, you're a failure. That's it. Right? And you feel so down. You're like, oh, you know what? I didn't become an engineer. I didn't become a doctor. Now what am I going to do? It's over. And, and you know, like in Egypt, for example. In Egypt, your name is, gets put on a newspaper. Right? In America, everyone, you know, like in the U.S., everyone graduates from high school. Right? You can have a 1.2 GPA right, and you're going to graduate from high school. In Egypt, you need, you're gonna, your name's going to be put in the newspaper if you're going to graduate, if you're going to go into engineering and medicine. And unfortunately, if, if people don't get there, then they feel that, you know what, I can't dream. My life is over. I can't do that. I'm just going to go work at maybe the local uh, neighborhood store or work in, in, in a family business, which they look down upon. But entrepreneurship and business, we should be encouraging that in, in our uh, part of the world. And also, you know, in the, in the U.S., why is it that we've had so many success stories in the Muslim community? is because they see in these success stories, right? Omar Hamawi, right? He founded AdMob, mobile ads on, on mobile phones, and then he was bought out by Google. It was the third largest acquisition in Google history for $750 million, right? So when other Muslim Americans see this, say, we know this guy, right? We see him at the masjid. Look, how he's become so successful. He just came up with an idea, and he got support, and went out and did it. So other folks dream, and they say, you know what? I can do the same thing. So it's so important to have success stories you, edible arrangements. Has anyone heard of edible arrangements? Anyone here? A few folks. All right. Muslim brother founded this company. They get fruits and they make, make them to nice shapes. And they have an online service where they, they, they ship fruits um, and people give them as gifts now. And it's the hottest thing in the U.S. now. And everyone's trying to copy it. But it's the, it's the number one company in this, in this market. Right? Just came up with an idea. He dreamt big. Someone came and supported him. And, and he scaled his company. Story after story, I give you so many stories. Um, another one, I'll, give, I'll finish with this one. John Jay. Has anyone heard of John Jay? Ties, right? So this um, Filipino Muslim in Southern California saw that there's a, there's a market for, you know, high quality um, non-silk ties, right? Not only for the Muslim community. By the way, you know, he, he's become very popular in Malaysia and many of these countries, right? But he's actually got one of the biggest awards by PETA. Uh, PETA is the organization for the humane treatment of animals, right? So he's got all these huge awards. It's becoming a huge company now. He just came up with that idea. He got the support, and he was able to scale his company. Now, now the, the good news, and I'll just end with this. The, there's good news, you guys. The world is flat. I mean, the world is so flat right now, easy to access knowledge anywhere, right? Anyone can set up shop, right? Now you have Facebook. Right? You have all these social, social networks, you have the app store, it doesn't, you don't have to be in Silicon Valley anymore, right? You can start, and you know what they have in Silicon Valley? They have what's called labs, right? Plug and play, you might have heard of plug and play, and they're expanding. These labs, these incubators of talent, right? Where they bring young folks with ideas, they give them funding, give them a place to work, right? And then more funders come in and they grow these companies. And by the way, this is, hap this is coming, to, it's coming to Malaysia, it's coming to Turkey, I know these, this concept is coming everywhere. It's called incubators to increase its talent. This is how, it doesn't have to be in Silicon Valley anymore. We have challenges. Like I mentioned immigration earlier, 
One of the ideas right now is to build a ship, a massive ship, outside of the coast of California, right? A float can Silicon Valley, because a lot of folks can't come, a lot of talent people can't come to California, can't come to Silicon Valley, so they're trying to bring them, you know, off the coast, a few nautical miles away from the coast, into international waters, so they can work uh, with folks in Silicon Valley. So there's so many opportunities. The barriers to, to, to start a business are, 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 are down now. So there's really, there's the opportunities that are out there. And we'll, we'll address some more of this stuff in, in the Q&A and when we have this when we have the open discussion. Thank you very much, Basim. So we're done with the first part of the discussion. I think the panelists have actually shared with you the landscape in the Muslim world and has shared with you, you know, the success stories in the US and how things have worked in the UK. So right now, we'd like to give you an opportunity to participate and to influence the direction of this discussion. If I can just ask you to identify yourself and keep your comment or question as brief and as relevant as possible. So I see two hands. Uh, where are the mics? And I've got three. Okay, so can we go to the lady because she was the one who put up her hand first, followed by this young gentleman right here and the one right there, okay? Hello, hi. My name is Maria Malfoderi and I'm from Kuwait. And what strikes me in the conversations from, from um, both the UK and the US is that there was no discussion of the institutional barriers to entrepreneurship in emerging markets, um, and many Muslims are in emerging markets. So, some examples. The time to license a business. You were talking about Egypt. I mean, the World Bank study shows that licensing a business in Egypt takes somewhere between two and three years, and a lot of under-the-table uh, under payments. Another example, corruption, rampant corruption that influences who gets contracts, who gets financing, for, uh, who gets capital for starting a business, and so on. Um, education, let's talk about the fact that we have education systems that are A, limited, as you pointed out, but also that are woefully inadequate to prepare people for the rigors of a competitive economic environment. So maybe uh, if you could address some of those topics. All right, can we have the gentleman right here? Ahmed Zaman from the Muslim Council of Britain delegation. Just a, a question about um, this tension you sometimes see, particularly where SMEs emerge out of family businesses. This tension between um, the need to grow, um, the appetite for growth, and governance. Because I think there is an issue around um, in some SMEs, you know, where perhaps they're not so um, familiar or attuned to uh, issues around governance, transparency. Um, obviously, they might be unlisted, but still there may be legitimate expectations of stakeholders. So how do you, perhaps Dalshi and others may want to comment, but how do you balance that tension between the need to grow and also the importance of having um, uh, participatory uh, involvement in decision-making and governance? All right, go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. Hey, Basim, good to see you. I feel a bit seasick. I don't think so that's a good idea of putting a ship out of the coast of California. <laughs> really. They're offshore. They might as well be here in Malaysia, Indonesia, Kenya. You know? I don't think so that's a good idea. Maybe we need to change that. Okay. The other thing is, the continent of Africa, I think it's basically been raped of its raw materials. And I don't think so. And the people in Africa are getting a fair return for their minerals. And I think they need to have a better relationship. If they want raw materials from Africa, they need to do a lot more. So what we can do is probably, you know, let the speakers respond and then we'll proceed with the next round of questions, okay? So I think of all these three gentlemen here, before I kind of assign the question to uh, any one of you randomly, you know, who wants to talk about institutions corruption? So I see Basim, okay, go ahead. Well, I want to take the, the <laughs> cultural aspect. We, we, we addressed these issues and we were hoping folks would bring these up. Culture, you know, we were, um, one of the questions posed was, does Islam hinder entrepreneurship, right? The problem is it's not Islam, it's, it's the culture, right? It's our cultures, and, you know, we're not going to pick on any particular um, um, culture here, uh, but in, in many of our countries in the Muslim world, um, it's the culture of nepotism, right? Where people are afraid, some people are afraid to start companies because once they become successful, someone in the government is going to come and take a large share of the company and pass it to his cousin and all this. This is true. I mean, it's true. You saw what happened under Mubarak. Now it's coming out. You see what's happening in Syria's Assad. 
These are serious issues with the culture of these countries. So people can dream. They don't want to dream because they know if they're going to become successful, um, one of the, one, someone, in, someone in the government is going to come and take a piece of the pie. And so as long as we have this corruption. I mean, I had a professor at UC Berkeley. He's not even Arab. He says, yeah, in the Arab world, you guys have vitamin wow. It's a vitamin wow. Vitamin wasta, right? Wasta. Connections. You, if you, ha you have to have the connections. And by the way, let me tell you something about wasta and having um, the connections. Networking helps anywhere. It helps in America, right? But not to the level that you have, it, like in the Arab world, that in order to open any door, hey, you know, I know this guy and this guy, give me a little bit of money and I'll connect you with this guy. As long as we have this culture, and this culture is so un-Islamic. It is so un-Islamic, but unfortunately we have this culture, it crept into our societies. And until we, we get rid of this culture, and I'll tell you, you know, I see someone from Musyad. Um, 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 Musyad is, is a ch business chamber in Turkey. And what a, what a model. I mean, the culture that they've created. And actually, can you please, please stand up? And I'm going to say, everyone, afterwards, you guys are going to come meet this guy. Um, this is a success model, a success model in the Muslim world. This is one of the largest chambers, and they bring Muslims from all around the world. WIEF is another model. We're bringing people together, right, to share ideas, to, to, to share best, best practices, and they all support it. All the, um, the, the businessmen in Turkey that are part of this, they all help each other out. They all help each other out, you know? And this is the culture that we need to create. And I'll end with this. You know, and unfortunately, culturally now, you know, it's like people don't want to mentor someone else, right? Because they're afraid that if you mentor them, you give them some ideas, he's going to take it and become successful. And what is our faith about? That's what our faith is about. Is our, faith, our faith is about making sure others are successful, right? It's like the idea that when you make dua, when you make supplication, right? When you make, if you make supplication for yourself, the angel takes that and he just takes it straight to God, right? But... If you make a dua for someone else, the angel makes that dua, a pure being, right, free of sin, makes that supplication for you, and then takes it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we always, in Islam, we're encouraged always to think about the other, always try to encourage the other, and when, when the other person's successful, you'll be successful. Even in a business sense, when you make someone else successful, it's going to help you out, you know? When you have the right intention and help others, you'll be successful. We have to change our culture. It has nothing to do with, with Islam. It's our culture's and we could change it. And, and everyone here, it starts with the individuals, right? We can't just rely on governments. The governments are not going to change our cultures. We have to change it, one person at a time. And you, sister from Kuwait, through social media. I mean, people in the Gulf right now, this is amazing. If you look at the growth of social media, Twitter. I mean, people in, in Kuwait and Saudi and, and, and Bahrain, they got like 50,000, um, 100,000, 200,000 followers on Twitter. Famous people in America don't even have that many followers in, uh, on Twitter. Turkey, what's happening in Turkey on social media? It's happening in our country, so we can use social media to change the culture. Thank you, Basim. I think before we move on to the other two questions, I'm going to put this question to Nash about how when you're helping others, you are indirectly and inevitably helping yourself. Perhaps you might want to share you know, a story that you know of in relation to this. Yeah, th thank you very much. And it's really building on from what Basim has uh, so, so uh, beautifully illustrated, um, very much around what, what I said also earlier when we look at the larger private sector companies, more looking at things in the terms of changing their mindsets to collaboration rather than competition. And, and leading on from that, uh, I've got a beautiful story which uh, actually um, Ibrahim Patel. Ibrahim, please stand up, please. <laughs> give, give him a round of applause. You don't know what I'm going to say yet. Why are you, why are you <laughs> pausing? Um, it, I was chatting to Ibrahim yesterday, and uh, Ibrahim, um, as well as being the chairperson of the Young Leaders Forum here at, at WIF, is, uh, is chair of a South African Chamber of Commerce. And we were chatting yesterday, and you know, he gave me this beautiful story about, uh, he, he does some radio shows as well, and, and, and uh, he was promoting the, the chamber, and this lady called in. And, uh, you know, she makes uh, nougat, nougat sweets. Um, you know, family business, small family business. That's how she earns a living. And uh, she said uh, to, to Ibrahim, look, you know, I can't afford the, uh, the, the 50 bucks uh, to, to join the chamber. Um, you know, so, you know, what, what can I do? So, so Ibrahim says, you know, look, run, run, run with us for a year. Don't pay anything. Then, you know, if you like it, you can join us. Ibrahim, in the meantime, was organizing a, a, a trade delegation to South Africa from the Gulf countries. Um, and 
who happened to be there, but the procurement person from Emirates Airline. And uh, he attended. So it was, it was, it was a, a luncheon, and uh, what, what, what Ibrahim thought was, look, how about if I ask this lady to actually place, you know, make nougat for, for the 200 odd attendees and just place it around uh, each of the tables uh, so they can sample the, the, the local, local sweets. And unbelievably, this procurement guy from Emirates had the new guy approached Ibrahim and said, look, this is great stuff. Where can I get more of this? So Ibrahim said, well, there's a lady, you know, sitting a few, few tables away from me. So he made the introduction, had a good chat, and out of this introduction, the lady got the contract for all first class and business class flights undertaken by Emirates. They'll be placing her nougat. So next time you're on an Emirates flight, having that nougat in your business class or first class, remember this story. So from a, from a scenario of whereby a small business making, what, hundreds of nougat a day, perhaps not even that, has turned into thousands, through a wonderful introduction, a very simple introduction, and, and that is a great example of collaboration rather than competition. I mean, Ibrahim could have had a different mindset. You know, if he's someone who feels insecure, et cetera, or whatever, he would have said, well, I could have played, he could have played this a number of ways. He could have tried to make the new guy himself, although uh, uh, having known Ibrahim for a number of years, I don't think he's a great cook, so I think that, that, was, a, that was a good call. Um, or, or, you know, he, he could have intervened and tried to, you know, earn a fee for making the introduction, like Basim. But no, it was in the spirit, the Islamic spirit, he made the introduction free um, and, 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 uh, and, and welcoming. And now let's just sort of look back at it. And I know Ibrahim's not like this. And I know most of you in the audience are not like this. But just let's look at it. What have you got here? You know, just think about it. You've actually got a win-win situation. What Ibrahim now has is an access to Emirates. He may have had other links, but he's got a really strong access, a commercial relationship into Emirates. He's got a great relationship with this person making the nougat. It's actually benefited him. Even though he may not take advantage of it now, he may take advantage of it later. Or he may want to just serve the community through this contact. It's a win-win situation. He wasn't thinking short term. And if more of us thought like that, and as Basim said, in the spirit of being a Muslim, try and help the other person, you actually end up in a win-win scenario. Thank you. I wanted to share that with you. All right. Thank you. So if we can move on to the question, I think the second question about trying to strike I think, a delicate balance between you know, the need for growth and you know, getting people to participate, making sure that there's sufficient transparency. I know this is a topic that you hold very dearly to your heart. Perhaps you might want to share your thoughts on this. Thank you very much. Uh, as you noticed at the beginning of the presentation, I did mention some numbers that are normally generated by the World Bank doing business survey. And just to respond specifically to the question, indeed, one of the things that uh, the World Bank doing business indicators measures is the ease of setting up a business, which encompasses aspects of how the institutions handle licensing, registration of property, um, and the rights of contracts. Now, from the numbers, it is very clear that these things need to improve. And so to encourage entrepreneurship in the Muslim world, we need to have a multi-pronged approach whereby the governments realize that issues to do with registration, enforcement of contracts, strength of institutions are very important. Then from the micro perspective, which is the businesses themselves, again going back to what the second speaker was talking about the issues of governance, like having non-executive directors, allowing some more people to come on the board of companies, enables you to attract capital. So the growth and strength of institutions is not something that can happen on its own, and there needs to be effort to actually realize that the business environment does not only affect foreign direct investment, but it also affects the probability of businesses started by entrepreneurs who are natives to survive in the marketplace. And most of the countries in the Muslim world are ranked in the bottom half or the bottom quarter. So there's something to be done. And indeed, we need to work on the regulatory environment from a macro perspective. 
then fiscally, taxes can be used to encourage small businesses to grow. For example, in, in England, when a business hits a certain turnover, their tax rate drops. That encourages people to try to build their businesses and attain growth up to a certain level. So the government response can come in form of improving the regulatory environment and institutions. Perhaps I must also say that, uh, for example, from where I come from in Africa, civil service or the people that handle applications are not well paid. So they tend to use the licensing process as something they can leverage to get money from here and there and bribes. So at the heart of reforming the business environment, people should know that public servants should probably be well remunerated. And probably that's why Singapore is number one. Thank you very much. I know we've got a question on Africa, but do you mind just repeating a bit, uh, unless if any of the speakers uh, wants to address that question first. All right, can, can you please repeat if you don't mind? All right, um, so misappropriation of resources, would you like to talk? I'll just take it real quick. I mean, you see what's happening in Africa? Um, look what Turkey's doing in Africa. Well, now well, you, some countries raped and pillaged um, Africa, and now those countries are leaving. Um, they're closing down their embassies and leaving. Turkey's opened, I, I don't know, I heard a number of 60. I don't know if that's accurate. Embassies throughout Africa. They're building hospitals. Their prime minister was the first, one to, the first prime minister to visit Somalia. Um, so you see, you're seeing a change now in Africa. Uh, and the Muslim world needs to engage Africa, and Turkey's doing it. We need others uh, uh, to join. And, you'll, and, and it's, it, is the, it is the breadbasket. Um, it has the resources. And so we need to focus more on Africa. Um, and in, and there's, you know, half of Africa is Muslim, too. And so um, I, when I was in Turkey, so thousands of Africans were in Istanbul um, learning different languages, learning uh, Turkish, and then getting job training. And, and they were sending them back uh, to their countries. Um, to, to, to be entrepreneurs and, 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 and develop uh, their society. So this, this is happening. This is a model um, that's happening. Um, and this is just a partnership between Turkey and Africa. We need to see more Muslim countries uh, be part of that. change. Okay. So we're going to open the session to the floor again. Please, uh, can you introduce yourself? And of course, keep the comment or question simple and brief. We've got one gentleman right here and one right here. And we've got one lady right there. Assalamu alaikum and uh, good afternoon. Jahangir Malik, Islamic Relief. Uh, it's, very, um, it's amazing to listen to you all speak today. And you're absolutely right. Um, a lot of it is to do with culture and the encouragement of free thinking and free society and free entrepreneurial spirit. We work in Somalia for the over the last 20 years, failed state, you know, lots of money being poured into the country. Uh, disaster after disaster, but one of the most successful things that I've experienced over the last year of visiting Somalia was the entrepreneurial spirit and the entrepreneurial nature of lifting people out of poverty in a completely downtrodden, destroyed, fragile, failed state. And the area that's really succeeding is the entrepreneurial. Now imagine investing um, institutional building in a country like Somalia, you wouldn't need the millions and the billions of pounds going into a bottomless pit of endless uh, cycle of violence and so forth, and economics can transform the entire sector. So the, 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 whether the, the, the institutions or the government policies allow and facilitate that, things happen irrespective because the entrepreneurial nature uh, of people wanting to succeed, and the, uh, and the economic prosperity brings that about. So, um, so I think that if government policies and uh, policies towards pushing uh, institutions to help create that nurture, that spirit of open, transparency, freedom, and, and support, you'd see a place like Somalia transform within one year, two years, five years, quite easily as opposed to what's been happening the last 20 years. And if we can replicate that in much more stable environments, 
uh, it's, it's a win-win scenario. You wouldn't need to give donations to organizations like Islamic Relief because trade would take its own natural route. But until then, unfortunately, donations can be made to Islamic Relief. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have the next one. Yep, yep. Gentleman right here. Assalamu alaikum. My name is uh, Muhammad Abdul Karim. I'm the Secretary General of uh, Southeast Asian Corporation Foundation in Bangladesh. I want to go a bit uh, beyond small and medium enterprises and talking about uh, a bit big size enterprises. The theme is changing trends and new opportunities. I believe that uh, innovation and R&D is so essential for the success of uh, enterprises. And uh, my question is what can be done to promote R&D and innovation among the Muslim countries. Would there be any institutional mechanism among the Muslim countries to promote R&D and uh, innovation in this regard? Thank you. Uh, thank you. And, and the lady in yellow? The lady in yellow. The lady in yellow, right there. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I'm just a student, as uh, I have lots of doubts about the cash flow that his previous, uh, the third speaker was talking about. I want to know, as a, as a young entrepreneur in the future that I want to be, how do you st start from the scratch? Like, for example, does the policy make makers are dependent on the uh, ideas that entrepreneurship wants to put for forward? Like, they are. You could say that they are in. Uh, independent, but I could say that as the topic itself says, the policies in the Muslim world have affected in the spirit of entrepreneurship. We can't deny that. I mean, we are very positive. I mean, we can be positive, but at the same time, how can you tackle this kind of issues that could hinder the young entrepreneurship from coming forward? Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Perhaps then we could start with the, the last question first about the participation and how do we promote youth entrepreneurs. So anyone would like to take that? Passing baby? Internships, internships, internships. We have to create a culture of internships in our countries where the governments can, can find a way to, to encourage a companies to all have internship programs. That's what, that's what makes so much innovation in the U.S. is that the interns, that most of them are not paid, they come to Silicon Valley from all around the world, right? They come there, they work there, they learn the ideas, and then... They, that looks good on their resume, right? So when they apply for jobs later on, they can get good jobs. And so, but we don't have this. In, in, actually, in the UK, this is another issue, the problem in the UK. There's no, it's very difficult to get internships. You have to have, you have, to have the network, you have to have the WASTA, you have to have the connection, even in the UK, in order to get these internships. We have to change in the Muslim world. We have to be able to provide internships for young people. Companies should have a quota. If you're this large of a company, you should have this many internships. It's, it's, free, it's free labor. You know, I mean, you should pay them, and some companies do pay, but, but it's also good for these, for these to put this down on their resume. So I know some countries don't have this, but this is what really helps America. What really helps America is the internships, the students that come in, and they come in, they learn a great um, um, a set of skills, and then that will help them out when they, when they go into the job market. Sometimes, and some, here's a challenge, too, for, for young people. Some young people have to work. So nowadays, the biggest challenge is for young people, they have to work and go to school. So they don't have the luxury to go get these internships. We have to, we have to create funds, right? We create funds to help place young folks in internship programs. And they are, that's, in the US we have these programs, well, they'll, they'll pay a stipend for their housing, so they don't need to work, so they can focus specifically on that internship, which is gonna shape their future and their lives. All right, thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, and just also from the UK perspective, I, I fully agree with what Basim says around internships, and, and Really looking at the education system in the UK, you know, traditionally the higher achieving people went straight to university, did an academic qualification, and then applied for jobs. Um, and, and if you really look at the employment stats, it's actually in the UK, for some of you who are, who are old enough would, would remember, used to have universities and polytechnics. And polytechnics tended to be those requiring less academic grades, but tended to be more practical. So. Uh, what, what happened subsequently in the sort of late 80s uh, is the polytechnics also became universities. So you've got this whole bunch of universities. And if you look at the employment stats of graduates actually leaving uh, 
uh, higher education, it's the ones who are actually more traditionally the older polytechnics. Or because they're training in skills rather than just academics, they increase the employability of the graduates. So uh, now in a conjunction with that, um, I'm aware the UK government is also looking at a parallel program, not just of internships, but apprenticeships, a uh, whole area around apprenticeships to have more practical qualifications. That as well as I think just answering um, uh, the, the young lady's question was also around again coaching and mentorship. You know, students, uh, if they can be partnered with a mentor or a coach, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be a great amount of time. It could be as little as 12 hours a year even. But uh, getting some direction, getting some support, especially during that early phase, I think is vital. Um, do you want me to speak on any of those subjects? Or you can yeah, what about the promotion of R&D? Would you like to take that up? Yeah, around, around the, the innovation, um, if, if you look at, again, you know, I, I refer to stats uh, in, in the UK, the innovation uh, is... 13 times more likely from someone working in a small and medium-sized enterprise rather than in a large company. So here again, you go back to supporting the, the entrepreneurs, the, the, the SME sector in the, in the country. In terms of support that governments can provide, again, I go back to the Growth Accelerator example in the UK, whereby you look at commercializing innovation and, 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 and supporting people how to commercialize it as well as in parallel clearly looking at the legislation, the copyright laws, the R&D laws. And, and again, just finally on that, so on, on the innovation, when you look at clusters, so for example, Silicon Valley, which obviously Basim has talked about, creating clusters within countries, and again, clusters which are not necessarily just one discipline. The most successful clusters tend to be the ones which, for example, marry up two disciplines. IT and healthcare is an example. But creating clusters can actually breed more innovation and exchange of ideas and facilitates the process. Thank you. Um, do you want to add probably another minute or so before we wrap this yeah, up? I'll, I'll respond specifically to the one about encouraging R&D. In order to encourage R&D and innovation, there has to be an incentive. There has to be an incentive. It's no coincidence that the countries with the most innovations and inventions have the strongest laws on intellectual property. Now, when I was told one of my friends that I was coming to Malaysia, he told me, you'll find people on the streets selling all sorts of mobile phones, but don't buy them. So it sounds like a joke, but it isn't. If you do not have a system that enforces that somebody who has invested in R&D and come up with a new idea is protected to derive an economic value from it, then it's not going to happen. I hope I've answered your question. Thank you. Can I just uh, take the points on the... Um, Lifting the society. Uh, okay. uh, yeah, on, on the question on the not-for-profit not sector, uh, which was asked about how you can encourage entrepreneurship uh, as opposed to then you know, relying on charity handouts, which is, I think, the, the, the key question there. And again, here, I think the uh, role of microfinancing can take a place. And, and not only just simply microfinancing, but perhaps small business financing as well. So creating structures uh, whereby you're actually encouraging small entrepreneurships. Now this could be, uh, you know, for example, I'll just give a very brief example, and I know also Abu Bakr is looking at this in Uganda, but a particular example I came across was in Rwanda, uh, for example, where, you know, small businesses were created uh, for a group of village women who were actually cooking food, for example, for delivery to, to local offices. Um, and, and, and there, the, what happened was this was a project on the ground. And, and you may think, you know, I can just leave it at that. Well, actually, there were some issues around that because a small business had been created without the requisite skill set and running into losses. And when they got outside expertise in, uh, the outside consultant was able to uh, market the business in a much more effective way so that actually the business wasn't running at a loss, but was, was running at a profit. And the ladies who were participating increased their income fivefold. So there, there, there's sort of a balance between the spirit of creating these local businesses but ensuring they're getting outside expertise. I'm so sorry. I'm going to have to put uh, all the questions to Anne because you know, I've been given the signal to, put, uh, to wrap this up as quickly as possible. But thank you very much for staying back. And please, please just hang in there for another 60 seconds because here's the twist that I would like to share with you. I mean, we understand the frustration that, you know, uh, many of you may have, including myself, that most discussions end up in just yet another discussion. So we'd like to change things a bit and we'd like to achieve some sort of tangible outcome. We'd like to put things in action. So the panelists are extremely energetic. 
absolutely passionate about this cause, and they've actually agreed to, you know, have or run a little initiative. And we'd like to throw this challenge to the members of the audience to participate in a mentoring program. So, uh, you know, right at the end, you know, I mean, if you put up your hand, okay, there's a young gentleman right there with two boxes. If you'd like to participate and you think you can commit to this, you can either A, offer to become a mentor, or B, offer to be mentor. You can be a seasoned entrepreneur or even, you know, an aspiring entrepreneur. And what we can do is that we'll try to match you up and we'll give you the absolute freedom to run the, uh, the, the, the mentoring program as you wish to do it. And, you know, we'll check with you six months from now. You can always reach out to us or to any of the panelists uh, who will be advising this. And then, you know, one year from now, let's hear if we have a successful uh, story. And, you know, perhaps if we do, maybe we can, you know, discuss with the Secretariat to see if we can feature one of you and see how you can actually interpret and, you know, try to make the spirit of, you know, entrepreneurship out of this program. So right at the end before you leave, the two boxes, drop your name card, yeah, and we'll try to match you up. And uh, we hope to hear good stories and inshallah successful stories from you uh, one year from now. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your attention and we hope you'll participate. Thank you to our moderator and our panel of speakers. I'd like to invite you to kindly take a group picture and also thank you for the addition initiative at the end. Ladies and gentlemen, while the photo picture taking is happening, we will swiftly move into our fourth session for today, Crowdsourcing 101, Growing Ideas for Change. Are you ready for us, nurturing social entrepreneurship in youth? And the background of this session is that it only takes one person to come up with an idea, but it takes a full community to perfect it. And for this, we have one very inspiring speaker who will be making his way up to the stage shortly. But once again, please put your hands together for a fantastic session that we've just had here. Thank you very much. <laughs>